All right, everyone, it is 1.30, so we're going to go ahead and get started. This is Lauren Gunn with Compto National. I would like to thank you all for joining us today for the DBE Best Practices webinar series, The Art of Estimating, The Basics. If you are calling in for, to the number for audio, please make sure your mic is muted as to limit background noise and any interruptions that could possibly disturb the other listeners. We also ask that you please mute your phones. Additionally, please do not put your call on hold as it will interfere with the webinar presenter. Should you need to take another call during the webinar, please log off. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please use the chat box located at the right-hand side of the screen and using the drop-down box, make sure you are sending your message to Comto National only. I would now like to introduce you to your moderator for today, Mr. Ken Middleton. Ken Middleton is a Senior Manager for Diversity and, Equ and Equity Program at the Jacksonville Transportation Authority. He is responsible for the daily administration and implementation of the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Equal Opportunity, Equal Employment Opportunity, Title VI in Americans with Disabilities Act compliance programs. Ken has been employed with JTA for 16 years. The DBE program at JTA has seen unprecedented growth under Ken's supervision. Other supportive programs such as Back to Work, Access to Capital, and Business Development Academy have been added that assist small minority businesses with their firm's development. Mr. Ken Milton. Thank you, Lauren, and welcome everyone uh, to the webinar. Uh, just right quick, and I don't want to, to belabor because uh, we have two outstanding uh, presenters today, and I want to give them as much time as possible to go through the presentations. But uh, today, uh, we want to talk about the art of estimating. And as a small business, it, it's so important because oftentimes you may have missed out on an award, some one that you really truly coveted because you didn't sharpen your, your pencil enough to competitively bid on design or, or uh, build projects, RFPs or professional services. So we feel today that this seminar will help you uh, understand the, the pros and cons uh, and the importance of, of estimating. Just a little bit about the, uh, the webinars and the uh, hub sub, uh, subcommittee. Uh, we try to put these on these webinars uh, periodically in support of our hubs, and hub stands for historically underutilized businesses, our small businesses, and our DBEs, to, to try and bring uh, important uh, uh, facts to you to help you strengthen your business, and uh, we really want to see you uh, succeed. Uh, one thing of important note, uh, one that the hub sub subcommittee has been working on, and we uh, anticipate being able to unveil it at the national conference in July in Baltimore, and that is the uh, the, the database uh, uh, for minority uh, and small businesses. And this database is going to allow you to our prime contractors and our small businesses and our agencies, uh, as they are looking for hubs or DBEs or small businesses to do work uh, on various projects. This database will allow them to go in and find those uh, those uh, those firms and then contact you. So. We just ask you to stay tuned. We anticipate it coming out or us actually unveiling it at the, uh, the national uh, meeting in July. And if you're not aware, uh, the national convention would be held uh, in Baltimore in July of this year. Uh, and I think Lauren probably will talk uh, about it a little bit more. So without further delay, let me just, uh, just um, tell you a little bit about our first presenter. It's Michael Regal. He is from uh, TDX Construction. And Michael is the project manager for MTA Small Business Development Program is responsible for leading a team in assessing contractors and developing actions to address business operations. In this role, Mike is responsible for delivering specialized technical support services in the area of operations, accounting, contracts, marketing, branding, and strategic business development. Mike has a strong background in business management, program and project management, coaching and mentoring, and has over 25 years experience in working with public areas agencies in the areas of transportation and infrastructure. He holds a bachelor's degree in construction management from Wentworth Institute and a master's uh, in business administration from, from uh, Branch College. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce and present Michael Regal. Mike? Thanks, Ken. I uh, I, pr I appreciate the uh, the introduction. Um, so 
uh, hopefully everyone can hear. Um, and I guess if there are any problems, uh, we can just use the chat box to uh, to let everyone know if there's a problem. Uh, <clears throat> so wh what we're going to get into is a couple of different elements of, of estimating. One is is the uh, higher level of estimation and what sort of what that esti what that represents for your your company and your business, uh, and then some of the the more intricate elements of of actual estimating, uh, which will be at the the second half, which will be handled by uh, by uh, my partner in this, uh, Steve Shanson from from HNTB. So, so the first question is sort of what does your estimate really represent? And and I think that at a core level, uh, whether you're an agency professional or you're a business owner, uh, we can look at this. Uh, it's really two sides of the same coin. Uh, so the estimate really represents it's a financial representation representation of how you manage your project. You know, it really takes your thought process of what this project is going to entail and turns it into a you know it, it looks at it from a financial perspective um so really it's it's uh, how do you uh, assess this project uh, what your resources are um and and really takes into account a full understanding of your scope of work uh, now, if you're a contractor, um, I, I and I work with contractors on a daily basis. Uh, I hear it all the time. Um, I'm going to bid this project low because I know that the agency missed something in the in the specs and the drawings, and I'm going to make make up my my money on the on the change orders. Um, and it is in, invariably it's the one thing that we caution our contractors against doing because you may think they the agency has missed something. Um, and it's and it very often comes into a, an, an area of interpretation. So um, we are, you know, frequently cautioning contractors uh, against that kind of a perspective. Uh, and if you're an agency perspective, if you're an agency professional, you know, it's the, you know, you want to be mindful of that as you are putting together your the project plans and specs um, to make sure that they they are complete and accurate. Uh, because it's better for you and it's better for the contractors who are going to be bidding on the project. But that estimate really, really represents, you know, the full understanding of that scope of work. Um, so if you think there's something missing, uh, you want to ask the questions because better better to have a, a uh, fuller understanding um, than, uh, than trying to, uh, to sort of wing it as you're, as you're putting the estimate together. And trying to get into the head of the of the agency uh, staff uh, that that's putting it out for uh, putting it out for bid. Um, it also represents what your what your planned cash flow is. As a small business, uh, any business really, but uh, as a small business, cash flow really becomes very uh, very critical when you're taking on a, a sizable project. Uh, you want to make sure that you've got enough enough cash reserves to cover you f until that first pro that that first payment gets gets paid. Um, and, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, different agencies, but, you know, conservatively, you want to you want to plan for 120 days before you get paid on your first uh, on your first requisition. For some companies, that is that would represent a significant uh, a significant hardship to try and carry the labor and everything else that goes along with it for the first 120 days. So um, that estimate needs to start to take into account um, where is the cash coming from and when is it going to come, uh, because that that will dictate uh, very often your ability to be successful uh, with that project. The estimate also takes into account your assessment of overall risk. You know, so where are the pitfalls in this project? Uh, are there long lead items that you need to take in, take into account uh, when you're putting that estimate together? Um, and where is the where are the potentials for going over budget? Where are the potential for running into financial difficulties? Uh, and that uh, a well a well developed estimate is really going to start to to uh, pull out those issues uh, and get them out on the table. Expected profit margins, uh, and we're going to talk about profit um, with with some greater detail in a, in a minute or two. Um, but expected profit margins, you know, what what is your expected gross profit going to be on this project? Uh, I, I talk to contractors on a regular basis, and it is the cautionary tale of saying, I'm going to make 20% profit on this project. Uh, and when you ask the question about where is the leakage going to be, where are you going to start to erode that, that profit margin, um, everyone is, expects that they're going to, the profit margin they go in with is what they're going to achieve at the end. Um, couple of things. One is very few uh, contractors are really, they get to the end of a project and they're done and they don't want to look back. The lessons learned associated with 
what was the expected profit margin versus what was the actual profit margin that they achieved and where was the what were the factors um, that uh, created the differential and there in general there is you're, you're not going to achieve what you expected um, but hopefully you were you were having profit at the end of the project um, that that ability to estimate the project and estimate what your profit's going to be and then be able be willing to look back and say um, what happened on this project and where did where did my profit go um, is uh, is a very important uh, exercise to go through and then the last piece is um, the estimate represents your your broad philosophical approach to your business, right? So um, as I was mentioning about change orders, there are some contractors who go into go into a bidding process and say, I'm going to low bid this project because I want to get the project and I'm going to make it up on, on change orders. Uh, there are some contractors who are going to say, I'm going to low bid this project because I need to I need to keep my labor working. I don't have another project for them to go to and I and I'm willing to take a lower profit margin uh, to secure this project in order to keep my labor working so I'm not going to lose my labor um, but that's the phil philosophical approach so when you're putting your esti estimate together you want to start to really think about what are you trying to achieve how are you going to achieve it um, and, and what are the what are the performance metrics that you're going to be able to manage um, as you're going through uh, which is which is going to be instructive because you want to make sure that as you estimate the job you're estimating the job hopefully you win the job you're going to manage the job and then you're going to look back and do your lessons learned and it really becomes very much of a feedback loop next slide uh, so as I said, um, you know, sort of the the think think of profit first, right? You want to put your profit up front and make sure that you are taking into account um, what you want to what you want to achieve, right? So this is this is a little bit of a project management philosophy as much as it is an estimating philosophy. Um, invariably, contractors are very good at at estimating the quantities, uh, the labor. Um, because that is the that is what comes naturally to contractors, right? This is what you live and breathe uh, every single day. Um, the the place where where contractors often often run into problems um, is not estimating is is estimating the the costs beyond the the quantities and the labor associated with it. Um, so things like mobilization up and upfront costs. Um, you want to make sure that you're taking into account, you know, what are those long lead items? What are the costs that are going to be associated with this project um, upfront that an agency uh, may be requiring? And we're going to talk about the agency perspective and the reporting requirements uh, in a minute or two. Uh, scheduling, uh, what are you know the the baseline schedules, the schedule updates, and those kinds of things, which are uh, going to be built into upfront costs to make sure that you have a baseline schedule that's approved by the agencies. All the other submittals that have to that have to be provided um, in the in the public sector contracting world. Um, if you are an agency professional, right, you understand the idea of MWBE utilization plans, uh, DBE utilization plans, if it's federally funded. Um, from a contractor perspective, this is, you know, very often the, you know, one of the areas that slows down the process um, and starts to add costs to a project that are sometimes unanticipated. Bonding. Um, your bonding costs for this project should be included in your estimate, right? So if an agency is requiring you to have bonding, um, those bonding costs should be built into your estimate because that should be coming out of the project cost and not out of your the bottom line of your company. So I want to I want to emphasize that bonding and insurance, and I sort of put them in the same category um, associated with that project, should be built into the estimate for your project. Um, and there's a number of ways of doing that, but but I just want to highlight the fact that you don't want to exclude those costs and then you get to the end and you go, oh, I need to have bonding, but I didn't include it in the estimate, but it's already my estimate's already in, and an agency says that that is, you know, that's on you, it's not on us. So um, very important to consider that upfront when you're putting your estimate together. Uh, equipment and facility rentals. Um, very often you know, projects require specific uh, specific equipment. It could be cranes, it could be scaffolding, it could be things that your that your company doesn't have um, 
in house at a, at a you know readily uh, accessible to you. You may have to rent them. Um, those are the things. Those are the kinds of items that very often get overlooked when when contractors are putting their estimates together. So another area of um, of concern that you want to make sure you you capture as you're putting your estimate to make, estimate together. And then the last is profit. Profit, profit, profit. Um, you you know you are if you're a contractor, you're in the business to be a business, and and as such, you're there to make money. Um, as much as we you know we would all like to be altruistic, um, you're in it for for the profit motive. Um, otherwise, you would be sort of you would be a nonprofit. Uh, uh, so make sure that you are incorporating your profit, and you're incorporating a profit margin which is commensurate with the kind of work you're doing, um, and is and is in line with what the uh, what the market will bear. So uh, if the market is you know if a particular agency you've done work with a particular agency and you see that on a regular basis you are able to get 20 to 25 percent profit um you know going in at a 15 percent profit margin is not going to be the the wisest decision to make um, if it's a new client a new agency that you're trying to get in with you may start to you know work with that profit margin in order to um to be more attractive at least up front and and um Think of it sort of as a loss leader. Um, I don't advocate loss leaders uh, on a regular basis. Uh, I think that if you're a business, you should be you should be doing it for a profit. Um, but you want to make sure that you are uh, in line with what the with what the uh, market will bear. Next slide. Um, so, with respect to to the agencies, every agency is different. Um, you know, it's it's a little bit of my experience has been across the board with lots of different agencies. Uh, I would say the uh, every agency is a little bit intricate, um, and they're all intricate in different ways. However, there's a little bit of of commonality in terms of the bureaucracy associated with a public agency. So, understanding that. Um, puts you in a very advantageous position. So understanding that it's going to things, this is not private sector where a client says, yes, go do the work. And two weeks later, you can have your, your uh, people out on the project site. Um, contracts are complicated in the public sector world, um, but don't assume that all contracts have the same terms. Um, if you are, if you have had the experience of being a subcontractor, um, there is probably a lot of commonality in terms of what your subcontracts have been to a prime contractor in terms of payment terms um, uh, across the board. With agencies, you know, agencies all have different perspectives. They have different tolerances, tolerances for risk, um, and as such, the the terms in the contracts may be a little bit a little bit different, uh, and the expectations may be a little bit different. So, from a general conditions perspective, you know, safety. Um, you know, there's if I have agency professionals on the line here, uh, they will all tell you that safety is 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 their number one priority. Everyone goes home the way they came to work, um, but how you manage that safety uh, within the context of your project and how you estimate your project from that perspective is going to vary. So I will tell you from a from the perspective of the at the MTA and within the mentor program we have, every project requires you to have essentially four roles on that project site. You need uh, a project manager, you need a quality manager, you need uh, a safety manager, and you need a site superintendent. However, we will, in our case, we will allow you to have um, two people wear, essentially wear two different hats. So generally the project manager uh, is the uh, is the quality manager because they don't require you to be on site full time. And the safety manager and the site superintendent are the same person because they do require you to be on the on site at the same time. So how you start to manage those um, those roles and those estimates, were, which are really all part of the, your general conditions, um, is going to dictate how you start to figure out where the costs are and how do you start to manage them from an estimating perspective. So we talked about safety. We talked a little bit about quality. Um, project management. So project management within, and it may be explicitly written out within the general conditions, um, can be a significant cost to your project. And if you don't estimate it, it's going to end up coming out of your bottom line as opposed to being a project cost which gets reimbursed by your, by your client. So things like project reporting, uh, project controls. Um, and within project controls, we talk about um, – and I know this is this is Steve's area, uh, probably as well as mine, maybe more so his. Um, 
project controls takes into account your schedule and your budget. So you may have a, an approved schedule uh, when you start that project, and that project may be a six-month project. The client may be expecting schedule updates on a every two weeks, could be every month, um, whatever the cycle is that they're that they are asking for. Um, there is a cost associated with that. As a small contractor, you may not have the in-house resources to do this on your own, and you may need to bring in somebody on the outside, um, which is a perfectly reasonable approach um, for large and small contractors. However, the cost associated, associated with that really needs to be built into your estimate so that you make sure that it's being captured. Um, and uh, it could be on the financial reporting side as well. You know, it could be you need to report on a monthly basis in terms of, you know, what's your, what are your quantities that have been um, installed? Uh, it could be your requisitions, right? This is all the administrative and project management costs associated with your project that you want to make sure that is captured appropriately um, so that it is built into your estimate, so it's reimbursable from the as a project cost, as opposed to being uh, borne by you as the business owner, um, just as a as a uh, business expense, which erodes that profit margin. So when you so when we're, I was talking about where does the leakage come from, and where does the profit margin erode? Um, it is very often these kinds of issues that don't get captured in the estimate up front, uh, but are required as part of your project. Next slide. So uh, very often we talk about, so the low bidder gets the job, right? Well, not necessarily. Uh, we'd like to think that um, this is, you know, a purely numbers, uh, objectively driven process, uh, but many public agencies are going with a quality-based selection. So they're going with, with what is um, termed so lowest and responsible bidder, right? So what you may think of as being lowest and responsible as a contractor may be something which is radically different from what the agency uh, considers a lowest and responsible bidder. So if you are an agency professional, what I would advocate is that you have some metrics in place where you're starting to, to evaluate bids um, so that we are you know, whether I'm an agency professional or a, or a contractor, there's a clear understanding of uh, both the scope of work, uh, the ethics associated with the, the contractor, and that can be financial uh, financial ethics, it could be background checks, it could be, um, it could be a whole host of things, uh, and the ability to complete the project at that bid price. Uh, but you want to make sure that there are some objective standards that you're applying to this because um, once you start to get into a subjective areas of who can do it and can't do it and um, you, from an agent, agency perspective, you start to run into some trouble. Uh, and from a contractor perspective, it just starts to lead to a lot of conflict uh, and a lot of back and forth in terms of, I should have gotten the job or I shouldn't have gotten the job. Um, sometimes uh, there are projects that you win that you probably shouldn't have won. And there are probably, <laughs> and, and, and there are jobs that you, that you have lost, which, um, you know, and vice versa. So uh, hopefully at the end of the day, everything sort of evens out. Uh, but there's a lot of different ways that agencies are looking to procure to procure contractors to do work, um, and it could be a pre-qualification of limited companies where you're then being asked to provide bids uh, against a smaller group of contractors, uh, and there may be more information that's provided to you. Uh, there may be discretionary procurements where um, I will tell you, in New York State, New York State agencies can um, have have discretionary procurement program of up to two hundred thousand dollars. So an agency can go out and procure services without having to go out to an open bid. Uh, it's a that's a much different approach than if you are. It's an open bid project, and anybody can bid on it. So uh, it's not always the lowest bid bidder gets the job, um, it's really the lowest responsible bidder, and sometimes it's about developing a relationship with the agency um, or, you know, the agency that you're, that you're looking to, to do work with. Next slide. So what else should we, con so what else should I consider if I'm a contractor? Um, Front-loading project estimates. This is, this is an area which is probably one of the areas um, that I see a lot of agency staff have a hard time with um, and are continually going back to, to the contractor to have them uh, sort of re readjust the, the loading of their, of their project. Agencies want to make sure that you are, you're not going to 
going to get to 25% of your project complete in the field, but you've collected 50% of your of your money. Um, it becomes a risk management issue for them. Um, and what I would say is, for, as a, from a company perspective, you want to make sure that your your uh, project estimate is roughly balanced against the the amount of work that you're doing in the field. Uh, project financing, uh, obviously, these are as we talked about, you know, 120 days um, out could be very common to get your first requisition paid, and very often that is um, that is all your mobilization, and that is you know a lot of a lot of money that's going out, but you're not getting any money coming in yet. So um, you want to start to think about developing a relationship with with particular banks to get upfront financing. Um, to fund the company operations uh, until that first requisition gets paid, and generally, once you get into that cycle, um, when I when I work with contractors, I am always advocating that requisitions go in on a regular basis. So, if you are if you can get into that habit of being um, diligent and submitting requisitions on a monthly basis, you know, first of the month you have a, a requisition going in. The first requisition is generally the one that takes a long time to get paid, and after that, you can get into a cycle where the cash flow, uh, and this is where we're talking about requisitions and cash flow, um, starts to become a little, a little ev more even uh, and a little more predictable. Uh, lines of credit. So if you've got a line of credit, um, in many cases, the the banks require a cleanup period. So you've got a line of credit, you've drawn upon your line of credit to, to fund your projects, um, but there may be a one-month period, and, and this is typical of what we see with a lot of contractors, there's a one-month period in which you need to be fully paid up uh, where they can they refer to as a cleanup period uh, and then your that money is available to you again at the end of that 12th month so you have to assume uh, first of all read your contract and and understand what the agreement is with your bank and and whoever is providing your line of credit but if that if that cleanup period is say the 12th month of the year uh, coming up on that you know at the end of that 11th month you need to know that you have enough cash flow in place to pay off um, whatever you're you have taken in terms of your line of credit um, and uh, and then you'll have it again uh, for the following year but that is uh, we see a lot of contractors run into problems um, because they're not mindful of, of of those particular items that are uh, required and then the last thing is your retainage retainage generally uh, and, and I'm amazed to see it all the time where I have a contractor that says uh, I, it's not even worth my time to go after the retainage. Retainage is generally where your profit is. Uh, you know, you may you may have you know typically five percent um, is your retainage. Uh, I don't know anybody who wants to leave five percent of uh, project value on the table uh, because everything else has been paid out at that point. So this is at this point is really about pure profit. The one thing I will uh, uh, throw out for you as a contractor and to think about. Um, there are agencies which will allow you to convert your retainage into municipal bonds. Uh, and this is, um, I was talking to a contractor about this and he, and he was telling me he does this all the time um, because what will end up happening is he converts his, if you don't need your retainage for cash flow purposes, you don't need your retainage um, from a profit perspective, right? You don't need the retainage to pay off um, the upfront costs of your next project. Uh, if you have the ability to convert those into municipal bonds, that money ends up paying for itself over and over and over again because the bonds, you know, whatever the payout is on the bond, um, you're taking money that you don't actually need now and it's going to continue to pay uh, in the future for all kinds of other uh, activities, and it becomes um, an asset to your company that become you know will make your company that much more uh, profitable and stable uh, in the future. So with that, uh, I'm I'm at the end of my uh, 20 minutes or so, um, and I will turn this over to uh, to to Ken and Steve to to continue. Thank you, Mike. Uh, our next presenter is Steve Shanson. Uh, Steve is with HNTB, serves as the project controls manager in the Great Lakes region. Steve serves, uh, uh, has more than 13 years of construction, estimating, scheduling, and construction uh, experience in heavy civil infrastructure projects, including alternative delivery. He graduated from North Dakota State University with a bachelor's uh, degree in construction engineering. Steve has st strong construction background and
experience ranging from site supervision, field engineering, estimating, to design build coordination on various types of projects, including uh, interchanges, bridges, math, mass, earthwork, and rail projects. His role uh, on large scale complex projects have provided a depth of expertise in construction delivery, operations, and management. Steve currently serves in many key roles uh, in cost estimating for HNTB. Steve? Thanks, Ken, and uh, thanks, Michael, for kicking it off there. Assuming everybody can hear me all right as well, and, and really, um, I'm going to take what, what Michael just talked about and dig a little bit deeper into the weeds on some of these items and, and really want to talk about the estimate and what, what makes up the estimate. But everybody knows or has an idea of what an estimator is, but somebody gave me this this definition of an estimator a few years ago when we were working through some things, and really, you know, the definition is someone who provides precision guesswork based on unreliable data provided by those with questionable knowledge. And, you know, if you want to see another definition, you can, you can look up magician and they're probably there as well. I, I just really put that there to lighten the mood a little bit um, because a lot of times estimating can be precision guesswork depending on where you're at with the level of design. <clears throat> um, but I do want to talk about it. We can joke about it, but in all seriousness, in all seriousness, we need to remind ourselves, you know, the estimate is essentially the basis and the foundation for success on the job that you're pursuing. So, you know, it's, it's your company's baseline investment for the project. And depending on what type of job you're looking at, you know, if you're, if you're a heavy civil contractor, if you're an SBE or DBE, it can vary on what the level of effort you're going to put in in this estimate and some contracts are flexible an owner just might want a rough order in magnitude and some some contracts are rigid you know you're in a hard bid and you're competing against two to ten other bidders and and you need the job to keep to keep people working and then your bottom line is dependent on that so you know with all seriousness an estimate is essentially you know what makes up the job that you're looking at and you can hit the next slide So going on to estimating, um, essentially the, the estimate, like I said, the foundation for success. Some of the things that I want to talk about and dig in a little bit deeper from where Michael left off is what makes up an estimate? What, what makes up the foundation of the estimate? There's um, one of the things is what are the costs in the estimate? We're looking at labor, equipment, materials, mobilization, upfront costs. I know Michael talked a little bit about uh, front loading and, and looking at the job, what your cash flow is. Are you including supervision? Is bonding a part of it? What are your insurances? Does the owner require any type, any different type of insurances? What's the, what's the uh, permit requirements? Are there taxes included? And just different things with equipment and profit. Again, profit. What what's your expectation for making profit on the job? And then what's the basis? You know, the other the other portion of it is what type of estimate are you looking at? Lump sum, unit price, schedule of values, the GMP, all these different types of estimates are going to play into how you look and how you bid and how your competition bids the job. So just want to talk through that. Uh, we're going to, the other portion of the foundation is, is just what is the basis for your estimate, a little bit more on that, but what's the level of design? I know if, if you're on the design side, you might be looking at a 30% design. If you're on the contractor side, you might be looking at 100% of the design. What's the basis that makes up your estimate? What's the schedule, the site logistics? Have you been to the site? Have you looked at it? Quantities, I'm gonna hit on quantities quite a bit because um, I, I know Michael mentioned that a lot of people spend a lot of times in quantities, but the quantities make up the estimate and that's where a large significant portion of what the estimate is made up of. And then what's the contract type? And what, who's the owner? Why are you bidding it? What's the, what's the advantage for you? Are you looking at it to keep people working? Are you looking at it to make huge profits? Why are you bidding the job? And then who is it for? Are you bidding on a transit project? Are you bidding for a DOT? Are you bidding for a private investor? Who is it for? Because all of those are going to play into how you look at the job, how you weigh your margins, what your competition is doing, and then how you're going to win it. You can hit the next slide. So talking a little bit about just stepping right through, you know, talking about the art of estimating, want to hit on the fundamentals as well. What's the contract type? We talked about that. That goes into the fundament, fundamentals of the contract, fundamentals of the estimate. That's what's making up on what you're looking at. The other thing you want to ask yourself is, are you a subcontractor? Are you the prime? Are you a vendor? What's, 
what's your scope of work? Understand what your scope of work is and know your scope of work. What's in the RFP? What's in the contract documents? What's the level of design that you're looking at? And what's your confidence level? You know, one thing, if you're a subcontractor, do you have the same risk that your prime con contractor has? Is the prime holding the majority of the risk? Or are they pushing that down to you as a sub or a vendor? And then likewise, can you use that to your advantage? Is there something that you can take on from the as from being a subcontractor, take that away from your prime and uh, maybe get some cost benefit from, or can you kick something up to the prime contractor, have them hold that because they're gonna be able to maintain that a little bit better and, you, and you're both getting competitive on the bid. So it all plays back into you know, what you're looking at for the estimate. And then again, what is the scope of work? Is it risky? Have you done it, have you did it before? Is it something day to day? Or how are, how are you accommodating that risk? And then uh, the other thing that we need to ask ourselves too when we're looking at the job, whether you're a large scale contractor or whether you're a small business, it really doesn't matter because it, it, it plays into it, but what is the competition? Who else is bidding on the job? If you're a design builder and you've got three other shortlisted firms, you, you know your competition. If you're a, a hard bid contractor at 100% of design, you can look at the plan holder list, you might have a pretty good idea on who's bidding the, bidding the job, but understand who's going after the job, understand what their capacity is, understand what your capacity is, and how is that gonna play into how you're going after the job. You know, if, if you've got a competitor that's extremely hungry, they might not need a huge margin to go after the job. They're, they might be in a position where similar to yours, maybe you're just looking to pe put people to work. Or is it in the other scenario where they've got a ton of work, they don't wanna get any more work, but they're not, they're not gonna pass up the opportunity to bid the job and they're gonna put a 30% margin on it. You need to understand what your competition is doing and then uh, go after it accordingly. And you can hit the next slide. So talking through that, understanding what are the costs, and I'm not gonna talk a lot about this, but just it goes into you know, the basis for the, for the estimate. You have labor, equipment, materials, mobilization, upfront costs. You're gonna have supervision, bonding, insurance, permits, taxes, dues. Understand what, what the labor costs are. You know, what's your equipment costs, facilities, rentals? What's the profit? Understand, you know, again, back to the profit factor, and I know Michael talked about this quite a bit, but understand what the profit is. Understand what your competition's profit's gonna be and then understand what yours needs to be. And one of the things you'll probably see quite a few times throughout the rest of these slides are risk because risk plays into this and how you're managing that in your estimate is gonna help you either win or lose the job. Or if you win it, it might depend on if it's gonna be a good job or a bad job. You can go ahead to the next slide. So talking through a little bit more about this, you know. Wanted to discuss a little bit just on labor and how you're looking at that. Is it a, is it a union contract, prevailing wage, understanding the schedule? You know, if you're going after a job with a prime contractor, you're the prime and you're looking at a job, and the job might be over three years, how are you looking at that job? I know I've, I've been involved with many multi-year contracts, and I've been involved with a job where it's, it's, it's actually bit. Uh, you got to understand the contract, who the owner is, and what you're doing about it. You know, recently I've gotten engaged with a contract where you only only gave one increase per year for labor rates. And if you're a design and consulting firm, that can be huge. You know, where that ended up is you have a yearly increase in your wages. The owner only allows one increase, but the market heated up. So you have to accommodate this influx of people and paying your, your people more. So now you're eroding at your profit because you got to give people wages in the middle of the year or you're bringing on different types of people. You gotta understand what your contract is, what the year is, what the schedule is, and, and similarly in construction, how are you factoring that in your labor wages across, across the board? You can play games or understand what you're doing for equipment as well. Know, know, if, it's gonna, you know if it's gonna help you to own a piece of equipment, if it's gonna help you to rent a piece of equipment, are you factoring in mobilization, ground engaging tools, your lube, fuel, equipment? I know, the companies that previously were in, they, they spent a lot of time and they had folks just dedicated to understanding how they can make money off equipment on a job. So if they could bid five jobs, buy a piece of equipment and build, build that into the job and win the job, they do it. 
And that's part of what you have to get smart on when you're looking at the job is how you can factor in equipment, get smart on it, and play that into your bid. Also, uh, materials, you know, understand what you're doing for materials on the job. Get quotes. Are you getting multiple vendors? Is there vendors um, that you can get discounts from? What are the conditions in their, in their terms? Is it a free onboard job site, or do you have to pick it up at the plant? Understand where you're, where you're picking it up at. I know Mike talked a little bit about mobilization, upfront costs, but you, know, you want to understand your cash flow as well. Again, if you've got to wait 120 days before you actually get a, a payment from the owner, that can be huge. That can make or break somebody um, very quick. If you can't afford that, you need to understand that. You need to be relaying that to your prime contractor, or you need to understand what your leverage is in that contractor to make sure you can get paid. And then taking into account supervision as well as safety. And you can go to the next slide. So a little bit more um, talking through, we looked at some of the costs, but also wanna talk about a little bit more on what, what is the contract type? What are you responsible for? <clears throat> because everything that you're putting in this estimate is based on the contract type. If you're an RFP for a design build, that's going to be completely different than a 100% design bid build. And I'm sure you all understand that, but the biggest thing is what's part of that contract? What are you responsible for? Read the contract, read it again. And, you know, Mike alluded to this. You, I've seen it, I've been not so much involved with it, but I, I know subcontractors do it, I know prime contractors do it. They're gonna identify, I got, I've got folks that work for me that that's what they did. If you got a thousand feet of barrier, the quantities only say you need to install 500 of it, they're gonna bid 500 of it and they're gonna pick up the other 500 once they get the contract. You need to understand what you're pricing in the contract, but you also need to understand what's the risk in doing that. So if you're going in to establish a long-term relationship with an owner, but you're going into the job, assuming that you're gonna have 25% in contract changes, you might not have the best relationship with the owner once that job is over. So you need to understand what's in the contractor, what you're pricing, and what are the risks. You also wanna understand what are the opportunities. Um, previously as well, just on the construction side, we had a risk register that, our risk list that when we're finalizing the bid, we took a look at each one of the risks, each one of the opportunities, and we had a percentage on each one. So if we had a percentage that 25% chance that you're gonna have a million dollar hit on the job, you price that into the estimate. If you had a 75% um, chance of opportunity, you're also gonna price that in, and that's gonna help you win the job. Also, again, do the drawings reflect what's in the contract? Are you utilizing that to your benefit, and are you being careful? And Usually there's a question and answer period within the bid process. Leverage that, to your exam or leverage that for your, your advantage as well. If you think your competition is going to get one up, you can ask the question, try to flush, flush it out, and make sure that everybody's on the same playing field that they're bidding the job. You know, it's, it's almost like a game of chess when you're in the bid process, and you, you don't want to give anybody the advantage. And you can hit the next slide. So the different estimating types, You've got lump sum, unit price, their schedule of values, guaranteed maximum price, GMP, cost plus, indefinite deliver, indefinite quantities, IDIQ, best value. You know, a lump sum job is completely different than a unit price job. A lump sum job, everything's all in and you better have it. Unit price job, you need to understand the quantities and how you're going to price them out. So just know what type of estimate it is and make sure the competition understands it as well. And then one thing you got to ask yourself, is the owner familiar with that, that estimate? Are they familiar with that type of contract? Are you on a design build or a design bid build, but it's a new owner and they might not understand? That could very well play into how you want to estimate the job and how aggressive you want to get on it. Going on to, to quantities on the next slide here. And one of the first things when I started out in the construction field, in fact, I think it was maybe the first month or two, they drilled, it was drilled into my head, quantities, quantities, quantities. And I know Michael talked about it, and this is where a lot of the focus is, but you need to understand the quantities because the quantities make up everything on the estimate. Um, and then you want to focus on it a little bit more. Your estimate is only as good as the quantities. So if you're taking what the owners provided for quantities and then bidding it, that's leaving a lot of risk on the table, and you want to manage that risk as a contractor. You need to understand that. 
Most contractors will take those quantities, validate them, and if they see opportunities and, and where they can get aggressive and where they can't and where the competition might be playing games, that's all, all gets back into how you bid and how you estimate the job. Also, quantities is essentially how you get paid. I mean, it, it can vary depending on the contract, but quantities typically makes up a large portion of how you get paid. So moving on, you know, the estimate basis, uh, you want to build up the estimate. You've got crews, productivity, everything that builds up productivity, the quantity are going to drive that. You want to right size your crew, make sure you have the right crews. How many man hours do you have? You know, do you have vendors? Do they have any discounts? Can you get any delivery options? Is it FOB job site or do you have to pick it up? Again, knowing that and understanding that and where you can leverage that. You know, one of the things for subcontractors, if it's a subcontractor to you or if you're subbing out to a prime, don't forget, you may need support or somebody may need support, and are you estimating that in the job? You know, I, I've done quite a few bridge estimates, and I've been involved in a few jobs where folks have missed that rebar tires don't just show up on a bridge deck with a crane. The prime contractor, you know, provides that, that hook for them. So you have to understand what the subcontractor needs, and then again, how can you team up with them, get aggressive, and win the job, and then win it right? <clears throat> Also, staging, phasing, waste. Can you optimize things? Can you look at recycling form work? Can you do something different with sidewalk? Is there, is there ways to get aggressive? Is there ways to, to look at that job and win it? And then review the estimate. What's at stake? You know, are you a single, a single owner that owns your own business? Is it, is it something that could potentially bankrupt you? Are you an executive at a firm? I mean, what's, what's at stake with this estimate? Another thing that's done quite a bit in the industry, especially on larger jobs, is you'll have a shadow estimate or a comparison estimate. This might not be done um, a lot with some smaller contractors or if you're an individual owner, but if you're looking at a large size job, a lot of times you'll have an actual shadow estimate or a comparison estimate where you'll have somebody internally providing an estimate or somebody like a JV partner if, it's, if the job's large enough, they're going to put together a complete separate estimate to make sure that when you're going after this job, that you're not going to leave something on the table and either one, risk losing the company or, or, or two, buy the job and then have to build it. And then quality, you know, I just want to hit on, we, we talk about all these things in an estimate, but quality is not just design, quality is not construction or the, the surface of a concrete slab. I mean, your estimate is a baseline for success and, and you need a quality product. So moving forward a little bit more, um, the estimate, understanding what the schedule is. Um, I know Michael indicated I do a lot with project controls. That's where I'm in right now with, with HMTB and do a lot across the country. But how long is it going to take to build a job? Do you need 10 crews? Do you need one crew? What's the productivity? Can you right size it? Is there any opportunity that you can get with the prime or that you as a prime can stage or phase the job differently so you can get a, a, a one up on your competition and then schedule. I mean, you should have one as a contractor and if you don't have one, you need to build one. Know what your competition is doing, understand the site logistics. You know, in the design build world, we said, you know, build a better mousetrap, understand the job better so you can bid the job better. And then if you're a prime and you've got a subcontractor, you need to make sure that they understand the schedule as well because if, if you're doing 10 mobilizations in and out, they need to understand that as well. You know, I've, again, going back, if, if you're providing fencing on a job, but you have to mobilize in and out 20 different times, that's completely different if you get the whole job at one time. So you need to understand the schedule and what goes into it. And with the schedule, you know, have a plan. Really, I, I, the next slide here, I have, why are you pursuing it? Have a plan. You know, nothing goes as planned, and then have you plan for it. And you can kick to the next slide, Lauren. <clears throat> uh, the photo on the next slide here actually just kind of threw it in there, but the one over to the right, you can see all these rocks in the road and it looks like it's mass chaos, but actually this was a planned shutdown of a major roadway. We blew up part of the hillside and it fell down into the road, but it was months and months of planning. And really why I'm saying that is, do you have a plan? Are you building it per the plan? And then you have to understand, as soon as you estimate, estimate the job, the plan is going to change. But that, that estimate, that bid that you're putting together, 
That's your first plan at building the job. So you need to understand it and you need to factor that in. I can't, I can't emphasize that, can't emphasize that enough. I mean, you only want to be so much of a magician. The rest of it, you want to base off education and facts. So you can hit to the next slide. So a couple of things, just more in the, in the philosophical side. Why are you pursuing the job? Um, I know we, we talked about this a little bit more, but really want to emphasize it. Why are you pursuing it? What's your capacity as a contractor? I've been with the firm where we've got a job, and the sole reason that we went after the work is we had to put folks to work. So when we went after the job, we got on the job, we said, okay, here's the estimate, here's what it was based on. We essentially bought the job, but we weren't there to lose any money, we were there to build it. So why are you bidding the job? Are you out there to make huge margins? Does your competition allow you to make huge margins? Do you have an owner that allows you to do that? There's certain jobs out there that, that can have decent sized profit margins, but it's a completely different industry, but you need to understand that and you need to know what you can leverage. Um, you know, is your competition hungry? One of the things that, again, I, I just want to hit on, there is a lot of emphasis, even from my side working in the construction field, is your side, you're continually sizing up contractors, even when it went to knowing who the owner was, knowing that if they were meeting with the owner, a debrief, an interview, you'd go up, you'd drive up, you'd see who was going to the interview, who was leaving the interview, who was talking to them. Sizing up your competition, understanding what they're doing, and knowing what's going to give you that advantage to winning the job. Why are you pursuing it? Is it a favor for the owner? Can you put some additional markup in there? You know, like Michael said, you don't want a, you don't want a loss leader, but are you trying to break into a market? These are things that you really want to ask yourself when you're looking at the job. And then who is it for? Um, that's one of the things you just need to be aware of and aware of what your competition is doing as you're looking at the job. You can go to the next slide. The main reason I wanted to try to focus on this as we wrap things up is, you know, when contract execute, I, the majority of my previous history was more on the execution side. So a lot of times I would get a bid that was put together, we get on the job and we would have what the estimator bid the job with. We'd say, here you go, here's your estimate, here's a job, go bid it and build it you know, with what we estimated it for. But your estimate is essentially the baseline work plan for how you're going to build a job. And everything that you do to bid another job is going to be based off the current job you're building. So what you want to do is make sure, you know, just tools of the, tools of the industry, trip, uh, tricks of the trade, understand your costs, manage them, track them, know them as you go through the job because this job right now that you're working on, that's going to be how you bid the next job. And if you can have good, accurate, historical costs to understand how you're going to attack the next job, that's going to set you up. That's how it's going to put you ahead of the competition. Understand why you track costs, know how you can leverage that to win the next job. You know, pre-construction, during construction, up to project completion, do a deep brief, Understand, did you only make 8% margin on the job? Did you make 15% margin on the job? You know, your current project is going to be the baseline for the next one, and your estimate's going to rely on how well you can track and manage the current job you're on. <clears throat> you can go to the next slide. So again, you know, to wrap this up, I, I just want to hit on again, the estimate is the baseline to execute the work. So it's only as good as the amount of investment you put into it. And then you want to build what you contracted. If you're estimating a job, you're not doing it just to go put it on the shelf, even though that does happen sometimes. You want to take that estimate and you want to be able to set up a plan to build that job based on the estimate. So build what you contracted. I guess with that, you know, hopefully you can hit the next one here, but hopefully that helps, you know, give an understanding and set yourself up for winning the next job. Uh, Ken, I'll give it back to you for any questions. Great. Uh, Steve uh, and Mike, we do have, uh, based on the, uh, the chat room, looks like there are two questions. Uh, do you, can you see them, Steve and Mike? Yeah. Don't know that I do. Okay. Okay, let, let me go ahead and just read them uh, for the interest of time. Uh, the first one is from Terrence. 
Besides the estimator, are there any other team members who should work with the estimator to develop a comprehensive bid? Sure, and we'll take, we'll maybe I'll take take that Yeah, absolutely. So whether you're a single owner and you're doing this on your own or if you're working for a large construction company, absolutely. The estimator is not the only one on the job. You want to be talking to project managers, you want to be talking to vendors, you want to be talking to subcontractors, you want to utilize project managers that are out in the field now. A lot of times you can bring in a superintendent or even a key foreman and pick their brain. Um, but you, you don't want to do it alone. It goes back into providing a quality estimate and even doing a shadow estimate. You can have, you know, on, on a large job, you can have a whole team of people putting an estimate together. So no, it shouldn't just be on the estimator and, and it should be a team effort. Great. Next question is from Alma. Uh, how much of a role does or should the prime contractor pay uh, in educating DBEs or hubs on why they were not, uh, uh, their estimate or quote wasn't selected? Are prime contractors interested in taking a little more time and showing the DBEs what they need to work on and to refine uh, to uh, to refine their skills to uh, for them to produce a more competitive uh, bid for the next project. So I'll I'll jump in on this one because uh, we see this pretty frequently. The one of the issues we see, which is pretty prevalent, and I hear from from small DBEs and MWBEs, um, is that they will provide estimates to uh, to the prime contractor, and then they don't hear anything. Right? It's not even that they the prime contractor comes back and says, uh, here's what the problem is, or you won it or you didn't win it. The, the, the prime contractor very often goes radio silent. Um, and, and, you know, so from a prime contractor's perspective, I would say um, they need to be a little more conscious um, of that and, and be willing to have the conversation with the, with the subs that they want to use and want to work with. Um, and what I would also say is from a, from a subcontracting perspective, um, it's about developing a relationship. So if you're a subcontractor and, and you provided a, a quote or an estimate to a prime um, a couple of times and you don't seem to win or they don't respond or right, they're tough to get on the phone, um, this is probably not a prime contractor you want to start to develop a relationship with because the way you start a relationship is the way you mean to go on. So if a, if this is the kind of service and 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 communication you're getting with a prime contractor in the beginning, um, it may be very difficult when you're trying to get your requisitions paid. You're trying to find out about payments, um, and they're ducking your phone calls. So, um, but yes, from a prime contractor's perspective, I would say um, if you are a prime. Um, Take the extra time. Have have the the conversation, which may take a few minutes, with a with a subcontractor who's given you a bid, um, and explain to them, you know, perhaps why they didn't, why they were not uh, selected. Um, it's going to be better for them, and it'll be better for you. Uh, it'll help them grow their business and understand um, what they may may or may not have missed in the in the estimate, uh, or they were overestimating things. Um, and from your perspective, if you can get them to be uh, more competent and and dialed in a little bit more, um, you're going to be able to to develop a, a sort of a roster of preferred subcontractors who you know you can go back to on a regular basis and and get quality estimates that are going to be um, useful going forward. Great, thank you, uh, uh, Mike and Steve. And I just on behalf of the Comto Hub subcommittee, I'd like to thank you both for this uh, often uh, overlooked topic, but one that is so critical uh, when it comes to uh, being successful uh, on, uh, on on bids and, and uh, awards. Uh, before I turn it over to Lauren, I know uh, there were a few that may have got on after uh, I had talked. I just wanna just uh, uh, reiterate that uh, the, the HUB subcommittee is in the final stages of uh, the much anticipated uh, Compto and Minority Small Business Database. We anticipate unveiling that uh, at the uh, the national conference. National conference will be held July 28th through August uh, 1st in Baltimore, Maryland. And this will be the 47th national meeting and training conference. We're anticipating a huge turnout. We're really excited. There's gonna be a, a bunch of, uh, of information uh, for our hubs. Uh, a lot of uh, conferences and workshops that would be uh, be, uh, be beneficial. 
uh, if you can attend. I encourage you to go on to the Compto website. That is www.compto.org uh, to get more information about the uh, national training. Uh, with that said, I would like to go ahead and turn it back over to Lauren. Hi, Ken. I don't have anything to add at this time. Um, Terrence, I think that you have one more slide. Yeah, well, uh, Ken has already uh, stated that. I thought it was very informative. Webinar. My name is Taryn Six, and I'm the chair of the um, Compto Historically Unutilized Business Subcommittee. I'd like to urge uh, all those that participate online, and even those that haven't participated that are within your network, to contact them and let them know that Compto is working for them, and we are uh, doing great things for the small business um, networking or the small business arena. And, and I urge you to become a Comto member. Uh, in addition to that, I want to just to thank uh, a lot went into the development of this webinar, which I felt was very well done and very informative. And I just want to thank all of the Comto Hubs subcommittee, but most of all, I wanted to thank Ken Middleton, Michael Rigo, Steve Shanson, and Lauren Gunn for participating and helping to bring this to a successful end. Thank you.